Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus. Amen. Tonight we look at the real value of the golden calf. Not so much the value of the gold, which would be tremendous this day and age, but the spiritual value of that warning against idolatry in Scripture. And I've got to be honest with you, when I hear a warning against a false god or idolatry in the Bible, it doesn't really bother me that much. I kind of shrug it off. Because the last thing that I or any of you are likely going to do is make an idol and start bowing down and worshiping it. I wouldn't even know where to go to do that here in Saginaw. It's just not a temptation to worship an idol. But I believe there is a spiritual value deeper than what we worship. And it has to do with our hearts. So let's take a look at the text from Exodus chapter 32 and get a feeling for the value of this story to us today. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down the mountain, anybody know how long? 40 days and 40 nights. Yep, just like the amount of uh, days it rained for Noah. He was up there 40 days. They gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So God to them was kind of far away and up on that mountain. They couldn't see him anymore like they did when he led them out of Egypt with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by, by night. And his spokesman, Moses, wasn't with them anymore. And so they're saying, we don't have a God that, that, that goes before us. And that literally means that is before our eyes that we can see. I would like to suggest to you that the people of Israel were bothered because they had no control over this unseen, faraway God. The idolatry of control is really the issue here. They wanted a God who was manageable, a God whom they could see. Well, let's see what happened. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. A couple things about that text. First of all, I guess I don't feel so bad when I see boys wearing earrings now. Used to kind of bother me, but it looks like it happened all the way back in Bible days. Not a big deal. Secondly, I believe that Aaron suffered from something called M-A-S. And that is male answer syndrome. You see, as a man, Aaron knew he'd better have an answer for these people. And that's kind of what we men do when our wives are upset or depressed or bothered and they want to talk about something, we want to fix it. We want to have the answer and end the discussion and that's really not at all what they need. And so Aaron maybe suffered from that a little bit and he had an answer to their uh, problem of God not being so close to them. So all the people took off their earrings, brought them to Aaron. He took what hand they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf fashioning it with a tool. So he obviously had some sort of a mold and then an engraving tool that he made it look probably very beautiful. A couple of things stand out in this, these verses. First of all, the God they created reflected their culture. Very important point. They were used to pagan people and other people and other cultures and especially the Egyptians where they all came from worshiping these false gods, especially ones made to look like cows, calves, bulls. There was a very clearly an Egyptian god that looked that way. So whatever we try to, to, to take from this world to give us that feeling of a god we can manage and control reflects our culture. Secondly, the Israelites were willing to sacrifice much to create this god. And I've noticed that in Christian ministry today. Many ministries can uh, produce a whole lot of gifts and sacrifices from people if it's something that they can kind of control, like building a building or healing a body. Interesting to watch 
the big churches that uh, have a lot of income, often there's something going on there that has to do with the physical that, that can be seen. People will sacrifice for that. It's a little harder to sacrifice for the unknown, the unseen, the spiritual mission that God has given us of reaching people with the good news of Jesus. What happened next? Then they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Now, this is a key verse. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. Notice capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Whenever you see it that way, it is from the Hebrew word Yahweh, which is the name of the true God. When Moses asked him, who, who should I tell Pharaoh is sending me to call the people out of Egypt? Yahweh, I am. And so they weren't replacing God with this golden calf, as we often think an idol does. That's not what they were doing. They were trying to locate God somewhere that was more controllable and manageable to them that they could see and touch and would give them visual, physical security. They were trying to worship both the true God and the idol. Interesting, huh? An idol isn't always replacing God. Sometimes it's what comes between us and God. You can just picture that. There's the people, there's the golden calf, and there's God up on the mountain unseen because of the cloud. And they wanted to worship the true God, but this idol was between. So what happened? The next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. And, and very likely that was to the true God. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Revelry isn't a good thing. Revelry is drunkenness, eating too much, orgies, and the like. They were wild. And God and Moses heard that. And there were, then you can read about them uh, further in the text, disastrous consequences. And there were disastrous consequences because you cannot serve two masters. It just doesn't work. It's not God's will. So what is our control and answer issues? People tell me many times when they're troubled that Jesus, that God, seems very far away. And that they want to do something or want him to do something or want to have some sort of a sign that he is close. And so often people will start looking elsewhere for that which will, will help them. What promises to give us control? What kind of comes between us and God and do we sometimes mix up a little bit and end up trying to worship both? Some would say money, some would say security, government. You know, people expect a lot out of the government, but the government isn't God. Health is a big one, a huge one. I hear it all the time. If you have your health, you have everything. No, 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 no. If you have faith in the true God, you have everything. Health is a bonus that enables you to serve for a while. But it's not everything. It's not to be worshipped. It's not where our, our life's focus should really be. We should be good stewards of our bodies and take care of ourselves. But we dare not let our health be come between us and God. You know, it's kind of funny. I had uh, somebody ask me how I was feeling, how I was holding up with uh, Pastor Paul being on medical leave for several months now. You know, how's your health? And I said, you know, my health is fine, and I'll be honest with you, I don't think I could get sick if I wanted to. And the reason is because so many people are praying for my health. And I've never experienced this before. 
uh, be, because I've, I've solicited those prayers and asked for them, and it says God is just lifting me up in my energy level. Thank you for those of you that have been doing so. I deeply appreciate that. But I know as well as you know that any one of us could leave this sanctuary this evening and by the time tomorrow morning comes, our world could be completely changed. Our health could be gone. There could be a heart attack. There could be a stroke. There could be an aneurysm. There could be a car accident. There could be any number of things that just like that would change everything. We can't put our trust in our health, in our pensions, in our bank accounts, in our things. How quickly we forget. How quickly they forgot the Red Sea. How quickly we forget the empty tomb. How quickly we forget that even our ability to be healthy, to have a heart that is beating at this moment is totally a gift from God. Our ability to make an income, to pay our bills, to work in order to make that happen is a gift from God. I think that's really the lesson of the golden calf. Don't mix the securities of this world with the true security that comes from God. And Paul made that clear in 1 Timothy, verse 10 especially. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with griefs. When that becomes where we put our trust, that's what's going to happen. Guaranteed. When Jesus spoke with a young man in the, the story from our gospel reading, teacher, he asked, what must I do to get eternal life? Jesus knew his heart, and Jesus said, sell all you have and give to the poor. And, and the young man went away sad, for he had great wealth. And just look at that last line. That young man could not transfer his trust from what he could see and hold in his hands to Jesus. Just like the people of Israel could not transfer their trust from something or someone they could see, whether it was Moses or the golden calf, to a God who would take care of them. Are we choosing sometimes in our life the safety of the known instead of trusting Jesus? That's the question I hope many people struggle with this week. Uh, uh, and, and think about and, 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 and get it straight. Now, please understand me. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with having things, that there's anything wrong with having a job and income and that it's important. In fact, I encouraged everybody this weekend and you the same way. When you leave this place and you'll go back to your world of things and your bank accounts and your money and your income and your jobs, do your absolute best to manage them well. Take care of them. Work hard at them. But don't treasure them above your faith and your Lord. Keep God where your altar is placed. Don't place your altar in any of these things. We'll end with uh, two scriptures, or three scriptures. No servant can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. And the question, where is your altar placed? But finally, these two I'd like you to read with me. Hebrews 12, 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And 1 Corinthians 4, 18, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I can't say anything better than that, so simply, amen. God bless you as you go back into your world of things, managing them to the glory of God with your altar firmly placed at the foot of the cross of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.